Chapter 4 The House of Flesh Malice's horse reared with a shriek, tossing its head and pawing at the air. The warrior leading the mount was pulled from the saddle and dragged across the cobblestones, trapped by the reins wrapped in his hand. The air rang with equine screams as the other horses in the procession caught the highborn scent and panicked. Sharp curses and shouted commands echoed off the close-set walls as the druki warriors tried to regain control of the mounts. Malus fought to keep his seat, his head bent close to the rearing horse's neck as it turned and bucked in place. Gritting his teeth, he strained against the tarred cords binding his wrists. Red pain lanced up his arms as the ropes creaked but refused to give. A crossbow bolt buzzed past the highborn spinning head, close enough for him to feel the wind of its passing. Malus caught a glimpse of one of the warriors at the rear of the column, his pale face twisted with rage as he hauled at the horse's rein and tried to fire the crossbow one-handed. Malus watched helplessly as the warrior's finger tightened on the trigger and his guts clenched as the weapon fired with a barely audible thump. At the same instant, the crossbowman's horse shied to the right, throwing off the man's aim. The bolt went past Malice's head in a dark blur, followed by the distinctive crack of an iron head striking steel plate. A man screamed and the smell of blood filled the cramped space. Malice closed his eyes and bent his will against the ropes cutting into his skin. The raw pain of his wrists only fueled his anger further. The greater the pain, the more he strained against the bonds. Hot blood flowed down the cold skin of his arms, and then there was an intense flash of pain and a sharp pop that was more felt than heard, and the rope fell away from his bloody hands. The highborn grabbed frantically for the reins as the warriors around him shouted in alarm. A hand closed on his ankle. Malice looked down onto the screaming face of a druki warrior who had been leading the horse mere moments earlier. The man still had Malice's reins in a white-knuckled grip, and now tried to pull the highborn from the saddle. Malice pulled his boot free and brought it down on the warrior's upturned face. Bones broke and blood sprayed against the horse's shins, and the man fell back onto the cobbles. Yanking the reins free from the senseless druki, Malice hauled his horse's head around, aiming for the side road. Run, you cursed nag, he roared putting his heels to the horse's flanks. The animal bolted forward with a terrified shriek, sending house servants and traders scrambling into sheltered doorways and alleys as it raced down a lane barely wide enough to allow its passage. Angry curses and fearful shouts echoed in Malice's wake. At one point a flung earthenware bowl shattered against the wall next to his head, but the highborn only spurred his mount faster, knowing that pursuit would only be seconds behind him. He cudgelled his brain for memories as doorways and balconies blurred past to left and right. There was a turn-off, to the north, he thought, but how far? A servant carrying a basket of goods from the market ducked across the horse's path, shouting obscenities as he dashed for the safety of a recessed doorway. Snarling wolfishly, the highborn smashed his mount's shoulder into the fleeing figure, hurling the man against the stone wall and sending a shower of fruit and meat into the air. Malice looked back to see the servant's broken form rebound from the wall and collapse in the middle of the lane. Already the door to the house was open, and two servants were dashing out to see to the man, which clogged the path even further. Malice nearly missed the mouth of the street to the right. He hauled back on the reins at the last moment, and sparks flew from the horse's iron shoes as it skidded across the cobblestones. The animal screamed and bucked, trying to throw him from the saddle, but thanks to the demon's strength, he clung to its back like a leech. A loud commotion back the way he'd come told Malice that the pursuers were almost upon him. He eyed the northern street frantically, searching for familiar details, but found none. Cursing to himself, he spurred his mount up the road, just as a druki warrior with a spear galloped into view back the way Malice had come. The warrior threw the weapon with an angry shout, and Malice threw out his hand, hoping to snatch it out of the air. The spear point glanced along the back of Malice's shoulder blades, popping mail rings and twisting him slightly in the saddle. His hand tried to close on the spear haft, but the weapon bounced from his palm and struck the far wall 
falling out of reach as the horse shot northwards up the road. The warrior drew a curved sword and gave chase, howling like a vengeful wraith. More riders thundered into the lane in the man's wake, taking up the chase as well. A crossbow bolt ricocheted off the wall to Malice's ride and shattered against the stone overhang of a narrow doorway, showering him with shards of stone. This road was a bit wider than the one before, able to permit two horses to travel abreast. There were more druki on foot, stepping in and out of the shops lining the street. Many were household servants, evidenced by the torques gleaming at their throats, while others were highborn, tradesmen or off-duty soldiers. The servants scattered at the sound of galloping hooves, while the soldiers eyed malice with weary curiosity and fingered the hilts of their blades. Out of the way, damn your eyes! Malice shouted at the people in his path, wishing to the dark mother that he had a blade in his hand to add weight to his command. Up ahead, one soldier evidently took exception to Malice's tone and drew his sword. The highborn's mouth went dry. He aimed the charging horse directly at the man, but the warrior stood his ground. At the last second, Malice swerved left and the soldier swung his blade in a blurring arc. The blade parted the horse's right rein and struck a glancing blow against the highborn side. Mail rings popped with a dry crackle, but the armor and the thick leather chiton beneath absorbed the hit. Malice cursed viciously at the man as he sped past and got an obscene gesture in return. What I wouldn't give for a sword right now, Malice muttered angrily as he grabbed a handful of the horse's mane with his right hand and scanned the shop fronts along the road. He remembered a line of taverns leading up to the mere witch, but all he saw were bakers and fishmongers. His guts churned at the thought that he'd taken a wrong turn somewhere. Would you like a sword? Nothing could be easier, Tsarkhan said, its voice cool and slick with malice. Yes, he thought at once, but a word caught in his throat when he remembered how the demon had provided him with a way to navigate the labyrinth back at the Isle of Morhot. But I don't need a spur of sharpened bone coming out of my wrist, he snapped. Well, it doesn't have to grow out of your wrist. Leave the weapons to me then, demon, Malice snarled, landing the horse around a sharp turn, and heading straight for a gang of laborers standing around a heap of fallen masonry. Malice jerked back on the reins with a startled shout but the horse was moving too fast to stop. Human and dwarf slaves scattered left and right, shouting in alarm, and whips cracked as the druki overseers tried to keep their chattel in line. One slave didn't move quickly enough and was trampled beneath the horse's hooves, his wild screams cut short as an iron shoe split his skull like a melon. The mound of bricks spilled across a third of the street, part of a house's facade that had fallen away in an avalanche of stone. With no other option available, Malice bent low in the saddle and put his heels to the horse's flanks, driving it up the loose pile of bricks. The horse gamely leapt for the top of the mound, bloodstained hooves scrabbling for purchase. Near the top, the horse started to falter, and then a whip struck Malice's left arm with a sharp crack. The highborn roared in pain, but the sound startled the horse enough that it redoubled its efforts lunging for the top of the mound and plunging over the summit. Unfortunately for Malus, the pursuers were familiar with the construction. When they came around the bend, they angled for the far end of the mound, and as the highborn's horse hurtled down the opposite side of the pile, he saw two riders already slightly ahead of him and angling in from the left. One was the swordsman he'd seen before, the other carried a spear in an overhand grip, ready to throw or to stab. Of the two, the swordsman was the better rider, leading his mount around panicked slaves and small piles of rock, and pulling alongside Malus just as the highborn's horse leapt the last few feet off the brick mound. Malus threw himself to the right as a backhanded cut tore at his mail shirt just below the shoulder blade. Cursing fiercely, he spurred the ladered horse to greater speed, but the swordsman kept pace, leaning forward in the stirrups and slashing downwards with his sword. The blade struck Malice a hard blow on the left shoulder, just behind the collarbone, and a hot spike of pain lanced down his back as the edge bit through the mail and chiton beneath. 
The highborn felt his left arm go numb at a blow, and just at that moment his horse screamed in pain and slew to the left, into the swordsman's path. The two horses crashed together in a chorus of anguish cries and fierce oaths from the riders. The druky swordsman horse struck Malice's mount chest to shoulder, and for a sickening instant the highborn feared that the horse would be knocked onto its side. As it was, the two horses grappled with each other, rearing and snapping with broad square teeth. Malice fought to keep his seat, even as the other swordsman made a clumsy downward swing at his skull. Hard one instinct warned Malice at nearly the final moment. He jerked his head to the side, and the blow fell once again on his already injured shoulder. Fiery pain ignited from the base of his neck at the rounded part of his arm. In desperation, he let go of the reins with his left hand and grabbed at the man's blade. By sheer luck, his hand closed on the back of the single-edged sword. He felt the edge of the blade against his fingertips as he grabbed hold of the sword and pulled it towards him. Potent with battle lust and with the demon's terrible gifts, he all but yanked the surprised warrior from the saddle. The man was drawn far forward, his wrist well within Malice's reach. The highborn let go of the sword, lunging for the man's wrist in an attempt to twist the blade from his hand. But just then Malice's horse bit the other mount on the neck. The swordsman horse shied away with a cry, toppling the man from the saddle, even as Malice's horse gathered itself and leapt forward, fleeing the fight. Malice made a vain grab for the sword as it fell beyond his grasp, and was left fighting to stay in the saddle, as the horse galloped headlong up the lane and around another sharp turn. Malice could tell at once that something was wrong with the horse's gait. Looking back over his shoulder, he saw a black-shafted spear buried deep in the animal's rump. Terror was all that was keeping the animal moving forward, but the highborn knew it wouldn't last much longer. Still worse, he saw that the buildings had changed from shops to residences, many of which were shuttered or in advanced stages of disrepair. He was definitely on the wrong street. Surprisingly, the highborn heard the sounds of galloping hooves taper off just behind him. He couldn't imagine why, but he wasn't gonna question his good luck. His horse was already slowing as they reached another sharp bend in the road. With luck, he thought, he could find an alley up ahead and continue on foot. He rounded a corner and saw at once why the pursuers had reined in. The road ran on for another twenty yards or so and ended in a cul-de-sac overlooked by half a dozen ironwork balconies. They had him cornered. Malice pulled awkwardly at a single rein, forcing the half-dead horse to come to a stumbling halt. The highborn looked desperately about for a way out of this trap. He could hear the pursuers, hissing orders to each other as they walked their mounts to the corner. They would be upon him in a few moments. The highborn heard a door open overhead. He looked up to see two highborn children rush out onto the balcony and peer down at him, chattering excitedly. Malice bared his teeth, wishing he had them at arm's length. A thought struck him. He turned the horse in place, studying the overhanging ironworks. Looks risky, he thought, but no more than a blade in the guts. Malice urged the staggering horse near one of the stone walls and let it come to a shuddering stop. The first of the riders came around the corner, spear at the ready. The highborn grabbed the saddle's canti and drew up his right leg. Placing the foot carefully, he stood on the animal's back. The demon chuckled as Malice spread his arms for balance. You look like one of those ugly seagulls, Tsarkhan said. Is this some strange form of surrender, or do you intend to fly over your captors? Something like that, Malice said with a mirthless grin. Just as the lead spearman readied his weapon to throw, the highborn took a deep breath, bent slightly at a knee, and jumped. Without a demon's foul strength surging through his limbs, he wouldn't have had a chance. As it was, his fingertips just reached the iron rails of the balcony some ten feet overhead. He grabbed at the rusty metal like a drowning man, the fingers tightening painfully around the hard edge rails. With an explosive grunt of effort, he pulled himself upwards. Below, the spearman let out an amazed cry. One moment later, a spear clattered off the stone wall to Malice's right. Malice pulled himself upright and peered over the rail, 
only to duck back again as a crossbow bolt rang off the ironwork. Angry shouts echoed up from the cul-de-sac. Malice grinned. Unless Zirklar had a demon-possessed retainer, they were gonna be hard-pressed to catch him. Of course, there was still more climbing to do. The highborn eyed the next destination, another balcony, eight feet up and ten feet away to the adjoining building. Before the crossbowman could reload, he pulled himself onto the rail, took a deep breath, and leapt into space with a wild shout. He reached the target easily, grabbing the rail with both hands and vaulting over the side. Immediately he crouched to the balcony at the next house. Ten feet away and ten feet higher than where he crouched, two drooky children watched with wide fearful eyes. He gave them a hungry smile and they fled inside, screaming in terror. This time Sirklar's men were ready. He leapt into a storm of crossbow bolts and flung spears the projectiles buzzing around him like a swarm of flesh wasps. Malice made the leap easily. In fact, part of him was thrilled at the rush of wind against his face and the effortless way his body carried him from one balcony to the next. His shoulders stung fiercely where the sword had cut through his armor, but that too only made him feel more alive. Laughing to himself, he pulled himself up to the edge of the rail, and came face to face with an axe-wielding retainer who had rushed to the children's aid. Once again, it was raw instinct which saved Malice. He threw himself backward as the axe whistled in the air, missing his throat by less than an inch. His fingers slipped as he hit the limit of his reach, and for a moment he hung, motionless, thirty feet above Sirklar and his men. At the same instant, the retainer took another swing with the axe, and Malice grabbed for it with both hands. Seizing the shaft, he pulled himself forward for all he was worth, pulling the retainer off balance and sending him hurtling out into space even as the highborn slammed against the balcony rail. The retainer fell and Malice tried his best for one heroic lunge at the man's axe, but through either ill luck or drooky spite, the man carried his axe with him as he fell to the cobblestones below. Damnation! Malice cursed, staring helplessly at the lost weapon. Within the house, he could hear the children screaming and an even greater commotion coming his way, so he wasted no time. Still standing on the outside of the balcony, he turned to face the next balcony and leapt the fifteen feet between them. Another crossbow bolt buzzed past, but now there were shouts of wonder and dismay from below, as the men feared their quarry would escape. Malice paused for long enough to give the men a mocking salute, and then leapt from the balcony to the edge of the building roof. The slate shingles were slick and the roof steeply pitched, but the highborn wasted no time circling its perimeter until he faced the building to the west. It was a long leap, close to twenty feet, across a narrow road, but he hesitated barely a moment. Malice crossed his eyes and flung himself into space with a howl like that of a maddened wolf. Sweet, is it not? Sarkhan whispered in his mind. And this is but a trifle compared to the gifts I offer, and yet you turn your face from me, hiding in fogs of cheap wine. Do you see now how foolish you have been? Malice opened his eyes to see the tiles of the oncoming building rushing at his face. He landed hard, sending broken tiles slithering off the edge of the roof and then circled the perimeter of the roof, looking further to the west. There was another rooftop directly adjacent to this one, and then another lane that appeared to open into a small square. That one looked familiar, he realized with a grin. I am my own master, demon, he said a little breathlessly. Not you, not my father, not the witch king himself may command me. What I do, I do for myself. You are the foolish one. Indeed. And what would happen if you were to try leaping to the next building, only to find that I'd withdrawn my generous gifts? Then I would fall. And? And I'd have to think of something very quickly before I hit the ground. Stupid Druki, the demon spat. You think you got an answer for everything, 
You weren't so clever when you stepped into my chamber and slid that ring on your finger. You fell for that one rightly enough. I fell for it, true, Mallow said, leaping into space. But I haven't hit the ground yet, have I? The highborn was touching down on the adjoining roof before he realized the demon had gone silent. Malice took that as a good sign. Crossing to the opposite side of the building, Malice looked down on the street lined with taverns and teeming with soldiers, laborers and sailors. He looked further north, and there, across the square, he saw the gray sign of the mere witch. Malice smiled and gauged the distance to the next roof, another fifteen feet, more or less. He gathered his legs beneath him, took a deep breath, and left. No sooner had his feet left the edge of the roof than Malice realized that the demon's strength had left him. He flew for six feet and began to fall like an arrow arching in flight. Ten feet, twenty feet, he could hear the noise of the crowd below growing louder. At twenty-five feet he hit the wall of the building he leapt for, striking hard enough to knock the air out of his lungs. He tumbled, striking the edge of a metal balcony, and then fell another five feet before crashing into an overhanging sign. Wood cracked, hinges splintered. Malice and the wooden sign fell the last ten feet to land in a tangled pile on the cobblestones. Figures crowded around the edges of his vision, pale faces looking down in horror, shock or disgust. Malice felt a set of tentative fingers pluck at a money belt on his waist. With a snarl, he slapped the hand away and rolled painfully to his knees. There was a rumbling in his ears. Malice shook his head, trying to clear it. The sound continued. And then he felt the vibrations in the palms of his hands and realized what was causing it. It was hoofbeats. Malice lurched unsteadily to his feet. He should have guessed that a horseman would simply try to parallel his movements on the ground. It took a moment to tell left from right, but once he did, he set off for the flesh house at a run. He was halfway there when he heard shouts behind him. Something clattered on the cobblestones. Was it a thrown spear? Malice didn't stop to find out. Druki scattered out of the way as he staggered to the double doors of the flesh house and pushed his way inside. Smells of incense and narcotic vapors tingled in his nostrils as Malice stumbled into the heat and shadow beyond the doorway. Servants stepped hesitantly forward, uncertain what to make of a bloodied highborn in battered corsair armor reeling drunkenly in the entry hall. An armed retainer stepped forward, one hand outstretched. Your weapon, sir, he said. Malice laughed, showing up his empty hands and pushed past the bemused guard. His body was moving purely on instinct, acting on drunken memory of years past. The highborn went left, locating the descending stairway almost at once and rushing downwards into scented darkness. The stairway swept downward in a broad, lazy spiral, leading past doorways strung with curtains of soft seal hide. Faint sounds issued from within the chambers. Laughter, impassioned murmurs, or gasps of pain. Music hung in the heavy air, drifting languidly from some hidden room. Malice continued on, picking up his pace when he began to hear urgent cries echoing from above. His descent came to an end in a circular room lit with glowing braziers. There were eight doors around the perimeter of the chamber, each one leading to a sumptuous suite reserved for the wealthy of the noble-born. Servants came and went through the doors, bearing trays of refreshments. Fantastic creatures loomed over each portal, dragons, manticores, chimeras and the like. One doorway was framed by a couple of crouching Nauglir. With a hungry smile, Malice crossed the room and pushed the door wide. Beyond lay an octagonal room lit by the bank coals of half a dozen braziers. Carpets and cushions covered the stone floor, surrounding platters heaped with breads, cheeses and fruit. Flagons of wine glittered in the ruddy light and smoke hung thick and blue in the air. Half a dozen figures in hooded Autari cloaks lounged on the cushions, amusing themselves with a number of human and elf slaves. Angry shouts echoed from the stairway. Malice staggered across the room, lurching across the soft and treacherous carpets. 
Slaves scattered as he made his way towards a platter of roast meat close to the center of the room. His eyes were on the long, broad-bladed knife gleaming beside the long fork at the edge of the platter. Circlar and six of his men burst into the room on Malice's heels, their faces flushed and swords held at a ready. The highborn swept past the platter, his hand closing on a curved wooden grip and turned to face his pursuers. Malice showed his teeth to the men of the tower and raised the long, twin-tined meat fork he'd grabbed by mistake. Slaves scattered to the far corners of the room. The Altari were motionless, watching the scene from the depths of their hoods. I suppose you'd like to discuss terms of surrender, the highborn said. Circlar smiled. Cut off his hands and pluck out his tongue, he told to the men. We'll let his father ransom them back in a jar. Malice fell back as the six warriors made their way carefully across the room. He retreated until his back touched the far wall and then waited, meat fork at a ready. The warriors spread into a rough semicircle, weary of his strange abilities, but confident in their greater numbers. They were halfway across the room when the Autari sprang into action. Without a word passing between them, they drew long knives from their voluminous sleeves and leapt at the tower men. Caught by surprise, the warriors were tackled and pulled to the floor. Knife blades flashed, cutting hamstrings, wrists and throats. Blood soaked the rugs in moments as the warriors thrashed, kicking over plates and flagons in the throes of death. Circlar recoiled in horror at the slaughter unfolding before him. The young highborn sword wavered and then fell to the floor. He turned to run, but Malice crossed the room in three strides, running over the bodies of the dying men and grabbing a handful of the lord's long black hair. The twin tines of the fork plunged deep into the side of Circlar's throat. The highborn went rigid, coughing a spray of bright arterial blood. Malice let him go, turning and picking up Circlar's fallen sword as the young lord fell to his knees. Malice studied the blade and nodded approvingly. Better late than never, he said with a sigh, and then turned and struck Circlar's head from his shoulders. The headless body remained upright for a few moments and then toppled onto the side, still spurting blood. The highborn admired his handiwork a moment and then turned to the hooded figures. Would it be too much to ask for a cup of wine? he asked. 